to introduce to you Dr. Ajay Gol. He is the Professor and Director of Translational Genomics and Oncology and the Director of the Center for Gastrointestinal Research at Baylor Scott and White Research Institute, Baylor University in Dallas, Texas. He has worked on cancer research for over 20 years. He has been the lead author or contributor to over 200 scientific articles in very prestigious research journals. He's also added and contributed to books and book chapters. Some of his research has focused on the prevention of gastrointestinal cancers using integrative and alternate approaches, and he is one of the world's leading experts on curcumin and cancer. I have heard Dr. Gold speak many times, and every single time that he speaks, I learn something new. And so it is with great pleasure I introduce you to Dr. Gold. Welcome, Dr. Gold. Hello. Hi, Cheryl. Thank you so much uh, for having me on this uh, webinar, and I'm really delighted to join this. And uh, thanks again. Okay, so so let's get started. So as uh, good morning, everyone on the call. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have heard me before, but uh, for the next 40, 45 minutes, we'll go over some of the research I've done over the years on on uh, cancer, cancer prevention, and mostly the role of botanicals as to how very simple food-based interventions or supplements can help you prevent or even possibly cure cancers. So my research is mostly focused on cancer prevention. As you all know, that prevention is a lot more effective. And there's tons of evidence over the years and even uh, going back, centuries back, you can look that prevention is the way to go. Um, but cancer is such a long, chronic illness that finding a cure for everyone, um, because it takes years and years, sometimes even decades, to to develop cancers, and it is very, very hard to find cures, and I'll share with you why. So essentially, prevention is something which we can do rather easily. Now, this slide simply shows you, just to make my point, that uh, different diseases uh, have a different uh, profile in terms of how good we are in terms of finding cures or finding treatments for different diseases. And if you look here, uh, this is the data from mid-1900s to early 2000s, and you look, there are four different diseases shown here, heart disease, uh, cerebral vascular disease, pneumonias, and cancer. And if you look, the blue bars are the data from about 70 years ago, and the brown bars are uh, from more recent years. You can see that we have done fairly well in controlling heart disease or finding treatments for it, and likewise for different infections and brain tumors and other things, uh, brain diseases. But when it, looks, when it comes to cancer, uh, really not too much has changed. So now you would automatically ask, so that have we not been doing enough uh, to, to treat this disease or finding ways? No, that's not true. We have done quite a bit. We have learned a lot. I think we have a fairly good understanding how different cancers evolve. Uh, we have some treatments also for some cancers that they do not work all the time, but, but we do have some help. However, the problem is that although we are finding solutions to, to managing cancer or treating cancer, but at the same time, the challenge is that our lifestyles and diets have become uh, equally problematic. So by that, what I mean is, although we are finding solutions to a problem, but we are also creating the problem at the same pace. So that is why when you look at these numbers uh, in the last 70 years, the overall cancer deaths have not changed because although we have saved a lot of lives, but at the same time, the cancer epidemic continues to grow. And I'm sure you all can relate that every single day you hear somebody new getting diagnosed with this disease. So, so the point is, yes, we are doing better in terms of treating patients to some degree, finding the cancers early on and so forth, but at the same time, we are creating this problem that the overall burden of cancer, overall frequency of cancer, overall incidence of cancer continues to rise. So that's why the net result is still a lot of people are dying from this disease. So when we look at the projections for this disease in the coming years, as you can see here, uh, the, the new cases are shown in blue. So for the next you know, 10, 20 years, the projections are that we're going to continue to have more and more number of cases diagnosed with cancer and equal number or, or the deaths from this disease are going to continue to rise. So I don't want to alarm you by this, but it is what it is. This is data. These are projections which, which take into account the historical aspects of cancer 
where we are currently and where we are going. So this is simply to give you a reflection that this disease is still on the rise and we need to rethink, we need to think very carefully that is there anything simple, subtle we can do to basically reduce the overall incidence of cancer because by reducing the overall incidence of cancer, you really reduce the deaths associated with this disease also. So when we look at, now what are the reasons? So, so do we not have good drugs to treat cancer? The answer is no, we, we do have drugs. I mean, historically, uh, we, we had uh, chemotherapy to treat most of the cancers, but in the last 10, 15, 20 years, we have come up with this uh, newer ways of treating cancers. Uh, we call them targeted drugs. And as you can see in the slide, uh, on the left side, you can see there, there are drugs which are used to treat different cancers, uh, and you can see the name of the cancers here, and, and the target, which is on the third column, for example, EGFR, HER2, BRCA1, TNF. So we have genes, or we believe these are the main culprits, these are the main pathways, these are the main genes, main, main targets, which need to be uh, focused for treatment so that we can derive any benefit from these. So we have a lot of new drugs, uh, but when you look at the overall gain in benefit, which is shown in the next column after target, uh, OS, uh, which means overall survival gain in months, you can see that the overall gain in survival of these patients, even when we treat them with these new modern drugs, uh, is not as good. And the other part is the, the cost associated with these uh, treatments are insanely expensive. You, you can see for, so, so these data are from 2010, but if you look at some of the newer treatments for cancers using some of these targeted drugs, the treatments could be upwards of $250,000, $300,000 a year for a cancer patient, and the survival gain is not that much more. So this is a problem that first we have these new drugs, but they really don't work all the time, and even if they do, they're very, very expensive. So that's why we have to think of ways to prevent cancers rather than finding being too hopeful that we're going to have anytime soon some new treatments to treat this disease. So why are we losing the war on cancer? Um, the, the, the reasons are, I'm sure most of you probably can relate one way or the other, um, that cancer is not, like I said before, cancer is not a simple disease. Uh, it takes years and years, and it is extremely difficult to, to undo the damage which has occurred over many, many years. And I'll try to simplify what I believe are some of the reasons why we cannot develop effective treatments of cancers. So here is reason number one. First reason is cancer is a different disease in each person. So what do I mean by this? What I mean by this is that historically we always used to think that if 10 people have colon cancer or breast cancer or some other cancer, uh, they ought to be same disease, but that is not true. What we have learned in the last 10, 15, 20 years is now, if you look at 10 people with the same disease and we look at their genetic makeup, uh, what are the genes involved in that person's cancer? Uh, and what we are finding is actually there are no two cancers which are alike. So although they, they are colon cancer, they are all breast cancers, but there are very, very small differences between, the two, between every single cancer, and that is the simple reason that when 10 patients receive the same treatment, only one or two of them respond to that treatment because that drug worked with their, the specific changes in their cancers or the, or the genes which were not functioning correctly. But most of the patients do not benefit from those drugs because there are differences in their cancers. So, so in other words, we need to think of this disease that it is very heterogeneous. So we need to develop treatments which will work for individual patients rather than giving the same drug to everybody and hoping that it will work for everyone. So the bottom line is, rather than looking at all cancer as one bucket, we have to see the genetic makeup, the genes of every single cancer, and then decide which treatment will work for that patient. So that's reason number one. Second reason is that, like I said, cancer takes a long time to develop. And depending upon the cancer we're talking about, it can take years, sometimes decades. And here is an example of uh, the kind of things I do in my lab. So, so this is the real data from a patient who had colon cancers. And all these lines you see on, the, uh, on this uh, chart, they basically reflect all the different genes, how they interact with each other. As you know, in the cells, we, in our bodies, we have close to about 20,000 genes, hundreds of pathways. 
And all of these genes and pathways, they interact with each other, and that's how our bodies function. And when a newborn is, when a new baby is born, if you were to do the same kind of experiment on them, you would see that all of these pathways will be linked by green colored lines. There won't be any red lines because a newborn baby is uh, healthy, there are no problems, so most of the pathways, most of the genes are functioning correctly. But this is an example from a real patient who had colon cancer, and you can see that there are many, many lines which are red. So by red, what it means is all of these genes and all of these pathways are not functioning correctly in that patient, and that is why they got the cancer. And now imagine if you have a targeted treatment which is gonna hit only one of the genes shown in the chart, which are hundreds of them and hundreds of pathways, that treatment will never ever work because this patient has more than one problem. So giving them a very, very focused treatment will never work. So that's why we need something which can, which can hit many, many genes, many, many pathways so that we can hope that these patients will derive any benefit. Third reason, most of the cancers are First line treatment for most of the cancers is chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is nothing but a chemical, which basically we give to these patients because chemotherapy is a wonderful drug in terms of killing cells. So I hope you heard the word, I just use the word cells, not cancer cells. So and that's the problem with chemotherapy. So when a patient gets chemotherapy, the goal is that that patient should be able to benefit from the ability of the chemotherapy to kill their cancer cells, but that is not true. Chemotherapy kills your healthy cells along with cancer cells, and that is a problem. That's why patients who receive chemotherapy, they, they normally don't feel good, they, they have all the side effects, they have all the symptoms, uh, because uh, chemotherapy, while it is killing cal cancer cells, it's killing their normal cells too, So which is not good. That's where the toxicity comes from. Also, chemotherapy kills any cell which is rapidly dividing, and there are a lot of healthy cells in our bodies which are rapidly dividing. They are not always cancer cells. So when, we, when these patients are on chemotherapy, they don't feel good because some of their healthy cells are also being targeted by chemotherapy. Third thing, which is very, very important, is cancer stem cells. So these are different than the normal uh, newborn baby uh, stem cells, uh, which, can, which basically turn into different kind of lineages to, to give different births to different organs and so forth. So these are cancer stem cells. So these are basically the root cause of cancer. So these are very, very small number. If you take, for an example, if you have a million ca cancer cells in a cancer patient, there are probably only a few hundred of these cancer stem cells, but they're the seeds for cancer. So, so chemotherapy does not kill these cancer stem cells. So that's a problem because you can kill all the cancer cells you want while you're on chemotherapy, but once you take the chemotherapy away, these cancer stem cells are still sitting there, and once the chemotherapy is taken away, these cancer stem cells, just like I said, they're the seeds, so they continue to give rise, to give birth to new cancer cells. That's why when these patients are off chemotherapy, within a matter of months or years, the cancer comes back uh, in most patients, and this cancer recurrence or relapses because these cancer stem cells were left behind, and they are the cause of cancer. And most patients, when they get this cancer second time back, the cancer is a lot more aggressive, and this is because the first treatment never killed these cancer stem cells, which should have been the goal. Finally, chemotherapy also damages the immune system, and as you know, immune system is absolutely important for maintaining healthy cellular function, but chemotherapy makes the immune system very weak, and that's why these patients don't feel good. So, so the point is, why treat cancer with a, drug, with a treatment modality which is going to promote cancer. So when you look at this chart, so this is just an example of how different countries across the world have different incidences of cancer. And as you can see, in North America where we're living currently, it is the second highest cancer burden in the world. So this is a problem. And because we have the second highest burden, uh, and uh, because uh, uh, the, the first one is in um, uh, some parts of Australia, uh, but we have a very big problem here, and that's exactly what we're trying to talk here, that we need to do something. Is there something wrong with the people living in this country uh, genetically? No, it's not. It is essentially comes down to diets and lifestyles. And you can see in the chart, uh, different parts of the world, people consume different diets, they live different lifestyles, and that either protects them or hurts them in terms of their uh, cancer incidence. 
And if you look at some of the countries like India and Africa, uh, where people have many other issues, people poverty is an issue, uh, lack of education is an issue, breathing clean air is an issue, all of those, but still they have much lower incidence of cancer compared to what we have in the U.S. And, and so basically this slide summarizes that it is not the genetics, it is diets and lifestyles. In this country we consume too many calories, we eat too much processed food, we eat a lot of sugars, and all the other things you know, uh, you're probably familiar. Uh, so these are all the reasons why we have such a high burden of cancer. So we, we, we began to look at this thing a long time back, and the simple hypothesis is what triggers cancer and many other chronic illnesses, and the answer is chronic inflammation. So chronic inflammation is the cause for most diseases. As you can see from this, that chronic inflammation is a spark that ignites multiple diseases, which takes long periods, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, pancreatitis, autoimmune disease. So if you have chronic inflammation, which is completely asymptomatic, which means we all are sitting right now, we are all listening, we are all talking, uh, but if there is low level of chronic inflammation persisting in our bodies, over time, over years and years, it can trigger any of these diseases. So what is the connection? So the connection is chronic inflammation does two different things. So chronic inflammation, our bodies are resilient, they are strong enough, our bodies continue to fight chronic inflammation all day long. However, if our bodies fail to take care of this chronic inflammation, this can, this can cause problems. And as you can see that chronic inflammation is, is a process. Uh, it, its job is to you know, basically reduce uh, all the toxicity uh, and uh, take care of the dysfunctional immune system, nutritional deficiency, all of these things. So what if we have continuous persistence of chronic inflammation, it can lead to all of these chronic diseases. So here is another way to look at the same thing, that there is typically some kind of stress uh, in the body. It could be a physical stress uh, at some point, it could be trauma, illness, any kind of exposure to toxin. It could be psychological stress, which is very important. We live in a very fast-paced society. You're continuously stressed due to work or personal lives. So psychological stresses are another trigger for, for uh, inflammation. And behavioral stress, lack of sleep poor dietary choices, any kind of stress can trigger a protein called NF-kappa B. So NF-kappa B is a protein which is basically a hub or the main cause for increased inflammation. So any kind of stress can trigger NF-kappa B, which can lead to inflammation, and one of the consequences of this increased inflammation is cancer. So can we treat cancer uh, or can we prevent cancer? Can we, can we fight this chronic inflammation by some simple natural compounds? The answer is probably yes. And here is an example. That if you look in the kitchen cabinet, typically this would be a kitchen cabinet in the Indian household, but many of these uh, spices and herbs probably are familiar in most households these days. And you can look, there's lots of evidence that these spices with which we typically have been cooking food for long periods of time actually might have properties which can help fight or prevent cancer. And here is an example, here is some data, which shows that approximately 25% of the prescription drugs we use in the U.S. currently actually are derived from plants. So this is not shocking. So we know that there is a long history that plants have been the source of um, different drugs, but now you're seeing the data yourself that almost 25% of these prescription drugs are basically derived from drugs. And almost 75% of the anti-cancer drug we use currently in the clinic, uh, which we have been using for a long time, chemotherapies, many other drugs, actually they were, they were some sort of modifications of the active ingredients present in many different plants. And here you can see as an example, some of those ones which are tre uh, treatments we have used for cancer patients uh, as long as 1800s. So these active principles or active molecules in these plants actually were modified by the pharmaceutical companies, and then they were given new names as drugs, but they were essentially the root cause, the, the basis of development of these drugs was in plants. So the thing is, we need to think differently. So we have always been thinking that, if, I mean, you would have heard from many doctors, many researchers, that we're gonna have you know, magic bullets, we're gonna have smart drugs, targeted therapies, which can fix all the things 
what we are suffering from, including cancer. But the reality is that is not true. We have been trying this recipe for 100 years or so, but we still don't have good drugs for cancer and many other chronic illnesses. So I think we need to think differently. We need to think of ways which can, where we can use multi-targeted drugs, means drugs which can hit not just one target, but multiple targets. So we need to think of polypharmacology. We need to think of things which can impact multiple pathways, multiple genes, because that's the only way to have a much more safer and effective treatment. And that's where curcumin comes in. So curcumin, as you know, it is an active principle in the spice turmeric. And the next slide will show uh, that, and just like I was saying, cur curcumin and turmeric are not the same thing. Turmeric is the spice shown as uh, on, the, on the top uh, picture, and curcumin is actually the active principle or the active medicine which is present in turmeric in a very, very small quantity. So turmeric, when you ground up turmeric, only two to five percent of turmeric is curcumin. So another way, turmeric is a healthy food, but curcumin is a natural medicine which is present in turmeric. So what do we know about curcumin? So curcumin is a, probably, to the best of my knowledge, it is one of the most important naturally occurring anti-inflammatory. The best anti-inflammatory I've known so far, uh, based on my own research and based on what I've seen, very, very potent antioxidant, very potent antimicrobial, lots of evidence that it is anti-cancer, helps prevent cancers, and helps even treat cancers, and lots of science. As you can see in this slide, more than 12,000 studies, peer-reviewed scientific articles. We're not talking magazine articles. We're talking 12,000 peer-reviewed scientific articles, which is a lot of science. Uh, so there's a lot of evidence uh, on curcumin and different cancers over the years, and this is, this is quite exciting that we have now a molecule, which we have known for centuries, that it works, but now this is probably one of the most researched compound ever. So here is just another way to look at it. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, again, uh, curcumin has been researched for virtually every chronic illness you can think of. Uh, here on this chart, you can look at different cancers highlighted, breast, prostate, colon, but I can tell you that virtually it has been studied for every possible cancer you can think of. Not only cancers, it has been studied for virtually most of the chronic diseases uh, known to mankind. There's a lot of science behind this compound. So what are the facts about curcumin? Uh, like I said a few seconds ago, there are more than 12,000 studies uh, in terms of curcumin and cancer, close to more than 4,500 studies. So that's a lot of evidence that curcumin works in cancer patients. About 72 human studies, uh, more than 300 placebo-controlled trials, uh, uh, and uh, lots of animal studies, and so forth. So the bottom line, a lot of research there. So why does curcumin work in so many different diseases and so many different cancers? The answer is simply in the slide, just like I said before, that the drugs we are using currently, they hit only one target, which causes inflammation. But when you look at curcumin, actually most of these targets here, curcumin hits hundreds of targets within our cells, and that is why a simple herb or spice like curcumin has such a broad spectrum of efficacy because it basically hits so many targets within our cells which help fight inflammation a lot more effectively than any other drug you can think of. Uh, is there evidence of curcumin in preclinical disease models in terms of its efficacy? The answer is yes. Uh, you can see here tons and tons of evidence that curcumin can help prevent cancers and, and done in many different preclinical models on different cancers. And not only prevention, there's a lot of evidence that it can also help treat cancers. Uh, and you can see here lots of different cancers, uh, different ways to use curcumin, uh, intraperitoneal, diet-based, orderly, many different doses. But the bottom line is, yes, it can be used for cancer prevention as well as treatment. So both ways. Now, when it comes to treatment, how does curcumin work? And this is a question which I'm asked often by patients and, and doctors too, that is there any value of using curcumin once the patient already has cancer? The answer is absolutely yes. So most pa cancer patients, like I said, they, they undergo chemotherapy, and the question is, once a patient is on chemotherapy, can that patient still take curcumin? And here is the data that the answer is yes. Curcumin actually helps as a chemosensitizer. So what that word means is that patients who are on chemotherapy at some point, they're going to develop a process called 
chemo resistance, which means your cancer cells become resistant to the treatment and the patients stop responding. But when they are on curcumin, actually, they're going to derive better benefit because curcumin will continue to sensitize their cancer cells to the effects of chemotherapy. And here is the data uh, that when curcumin was combined together with gemcitabin, which is a drug, which is a chemotherapy drug in pancreatic cancer cells, you can see here that patients are on curcumin alone, gemcitabin alone, these cancer cells, or they were treated with a combination of curcumin and gemcitabin. And anytime you see a red color cell, this means this is a cancer cell which is undergoing a process of cell death. So you see that in, in the last column, in the last panel, there are a lot of red cells, which means when you combine curcumin with chemotherapy, actually it allows you to kill cancer cells a lot more effectively, even in a disease like pancreatic cancer, which is quite lethal. Here is another example that when curcumin is combined with paclitaxel, which is another chemotherapy used in women with breast cancer, again, if you look at the rightmost column, that the effect, efficacy of the combination of curcumin together with paclitaxel is a lot more pronounced compared to the individual treatments with chemotherapy alone or curcumin alone. So this is beautiful. So what simply means is that these patients are already taking a very toxic chemotherapy, but just popping in a few pills of curcumin can actually help them benefit a lot more from their chemotherapy than they would have otherwise received the benefit from their treatment alone. Here is another example from our group where we showed this data that, again, this is an example of colorectal cancer, which is absolutely amazing because one of the challenges with curcumin is that it is poorly absorbed by our bodies. So what that means is whatever amount of curcumin gets absorbed in our bloodstream, it will help on a systemic level, but whatever does not get absorbed, actually it stays in the colon. So, so patients who have colon cancer actually stand to benefit multiple fold because they will have benefit from the amount of curcumin which is absorbed in their bloodstream, but at the same time, the curcumin which is not absorbed stays in the colon and gives them local effect. And here, if you look at the last lowest mode panel where you can see the combination of curcumin and 5-FU, which is 5-fluorouracil uh, chemotherapy, which is given to colon cancer patients, actually, look, this is the data from animals which were treated for only about 14 days. These tumors are almost gone in 14 days. So, but again, just to demonstrate that the combination of curcumin with chemotherapy actually helps kill these cancer cells a lot more effectively than chemotherapy alone. And here is another example that when you combine, we, we published, this is the data from our group, we, we showed that, that curcumin actually helps kill uh, chemo-resistant or 5-FU resistant cells, which means like I said before, that patients with cancer, they will develop resistance to their chemotherapy. But what we show here is that if these patients continue to take curcumin along with their standard chemotherapy, actually they will benefit more because chemotherapy will not allow or minimize the chances of developing chemo resistance so that these patients continue to derive benefit from chemotherapy. And what this slide does not show is that actually patients who will take curcumin along with chemotherapy. Actually, our study also showed that they can reduce the dose of chemotherapy up to tenfold and still have the same level of benefit what they would have gotten from chemotherapy alone. So this is good because reducing the dose of chemotherapy that much means minimizing the toxicity of that drug as well. So this is basically a summary of uh, to show that curcumin potentiates or increases the benefit of chemotherapy if given in combination with the standard chemotherapies used in most cancer patients, and this list is uh, simply to make that point more clear. Now, how does this work? This is just a model to show that why curcumin is superior to radiation and chemotherapy. So the purpose of chemotherapy or radiation therapy is to kill cancer cells, which these drugs do fairly good. But while they kill cancer cells, at the same time, these drugs have the propensity to kill your normal healthy cells too, which is a problem. That's why most patients who are on chemotherapy, they feel not good because they're feeling the toxicity of this drug. But at the same time, as shown in this blue colored cells, that chemotherapies or radiation therapy do not kill your cancer stem cells, which is very, very important because if you leave these cells behind, you leave that patient open for getting a tumor recurrence 
in time. It could be a few months, could be a few years, because if you leave these cancer cells, stem cells behind, these stem cells will become the seed for developing new cancer cells, uh, and it is just a matter of time. However, if these patients are treated with the curcumin, curcumin kills your cancer cells, but it protects your normal cells, which is important. So patients, and I get this message all the time from patients who are taking curcumin along with the chemotherapy that they actually don't feel as miserable when they were on chemotherapy alone because curcumin has this ability to, to protect your normal cells, which means minimizing the toxicity. But at the same time, there's a lot of evidence that curcumin actually helps kill cancer stem cells, which is beautiful. So you're taking a natural product which is killing your cancer cells as well as your cancer stem cells, which means if you kill both of these, there's a less likelihood or, or, or a delayed uh, onset of any recurrence if that were to happen. So this is beautiful. At the same time, your normal healthy cells are protected. So is this evidence, all the evidence I've shown you so far, is it only in petri dishes or animal studies? The answer is no. There's a lot of evidence that curcumin has been studied in human clinical trials, and here is just a partial list of some of these trials that curcumin has been studied in different cancers and many other diseases in different phases of clinical trials. Some are phase one, some are phase two, phase three trials. Some are randomized, some are not. But the evidence is that curcumin is not, not a petri dish or animal-based science, but there are lots of human clinical trials done on many different cancers and many different diseases. And here is another example that besides cancer, there are many other uh, indications that curcumin is actually actively being studied in different parts of the world uh, for different diseases. So what is the most important thing? Uh, I often get asked by the patients, uh, when selecting a curcumin, what curcumin should we pick? The answer is not all curcumin extracts you see in the marketplace are created equal. So it's very, very important. So when you buy a curcumin extract, you, what you have to look for, that is this clinically studied? Is there evidence of that particular extract listed on that bottle clinically studied? Not just just reading a label saying curcumin extract is not sufficient. You have to look for a curcumin extract which is clinically studied and there's enough research to validate those results. Uh, in my studies, we have used basic, mostly a, a specific extract of curcumin called VCM95 because and that list, that goes to the second point on this list that one of the challenges with curcumin it, is it poorly absorbed. So you want to look for a curcumin extract which has higher absorption. And I, the reason I used BCM95 in my study was that BCM95 is a high absorption curcumin, and this high absorption curcumin is because this curcumin extract is blended with turmeric essential oils. So when you blend this, uh, this extract with oils or fats, it helps enhance its absorption, which is good. The third, which is a very, very important point, is that you want to only ingest a compound or utilize a compound, a curcumin extract, which, is not contain, which does not contain any harmful solvents. So you're trying to take a healthy supplement. You don't want to be consuming something which has been extracted by harsh chemicals, and as a result, you're using harmful solvents while you're thinking you're taking a healthy supplement. So these are three very important points, a clinically studied, research validated curcumin, a curcumin extract which is high absorption, and a curcumin extract which is as natural as possible, does not contain any harmful solvents. So moving on, so, so that was a short summary of uh, some of the research on curcumin. So now I'll talk briefly about Boswellia. We have done some work on Boswellia, and as you may know, Boswellia is also known as frankincense, and the history goes back um, to the three wise men that it was one of the most important herb uh, even in those days, and, and it has traditional uses which go a long way back uh, in certain countries like India and Chinese traditional system of medicine where it has been used for thousands of years uh, for, for treating cancers, arthritis, asthma, and other indications uh, because of its ability to fight inflammation again. So when we look at uh, Boswellia, so if you take uh, Boswellic acids, actually they're all not the same. So they're, as you can see in this cartoon here, that boswellic acids are obtained from the gum resin of the plant Boswellia spirata. And among these, there's the one listed on the right side, uh, acetyl 11 keto beta boswellic acid, in other words, ACBA, is the one 
which is a major active boswellic acid present in the extract of boswellia. And boswellic acid, boswellia, if, you, if you take a plant or a gum resin from boswellia serrata, there are other boswellic acid present too. And especially when you look at beta boswellic acid, which are the, shown on the left three, they are actually pro-inflammatory. So you have to be very, very careful that just taking any kind of boswellic acid is not good. You have to be careful that beta boswellic acid actually increase inflammation. They are pro-inflammatory. So if you're looking for an anti-inflammatory boswellic acid, you have, to, you have to utilize the extract or a supplement which is highly enriched or optimized for ACBA, because ACBA is the one which is anti-inflammatory, while beta boswellic acid are actually pro-inflammatory. And here are some of the examples uh, of using boswellic acids, how they induce apoptosis. Apoptosis is a process which is also called program cell death in cancer cells. So this is just an example to show that using boswellic acids, uh, especially ACBA, actually triggers cancer cell death in colon by turning on this program of program cell death by, by changing the activities of these three different enzymes caspase 3, caspase 8, and caspase 9. This is another example from uh, some of the data from our group uh, where we showed that using ACBA actually uh, can potentiate, just like I showed you for colon before, can actually synergize with the chemotherapy given to can pancreatic cancer patients, which is gemcitabine. So here what we are showing, if you look at the rightmost column, the bars in blue, that the combination of ACBA and gemcitabine chemotherapy actually together can kill pancreatic cancer cells a lot more effectively than chemotherapy alone. So this is, this is quite encouraging given the lethality uh, associated with a disease like pancreatic cancer. Here's another example. And I've seen a lot of patients, uh, they, they tell me that it works beautifully in actually patients who have any kind of brain edema or even brain tumors. A lot of evidence that patients who have either swelling of the brain uh, and other brain issues or those who have brain tumors, actually, if they're given boswellia, they, they stand to benefit a lot from using either boswellia alone or even some combination of boswellia with curcumin and other botanicals. Here's the data from some of the data from our group, which we showed a few years back, that actually Boswellia has a unique property of activating some of the tumor suppressing genes, means uh, the genes which basically allow cancer cells to not grow. So, so, the, so as the cancer grows, these are the genes which, which become inactive. They are not functioning, so the cancer cells continue to multiply. But if you can activate these genes, they allow cancer cells to die. So what we showed many years back, that there's a process called DNA methylation or gene silencing. And what we showed that by treating cancer cells uh, with Boswellia can activate these genes. And as soon as we activate these genes, within a matter of few hours to days, these cancer cells begin to die. Here's another example of the effect of Boswellia in colon cancers. And you can see on the, on the, on the, on the chart here that when, when ACBA was given to, uh, ACBA was given to colon cancers in an animal model, even at very, very small doses, 200 milligrams per kilogram body weight is a very, very small dose that was very, very effective in killing cancer cells uh, in, in, uh, in these animals. So we showed actually, uh, this is the data from our group where we showed actually that uh, the mechanism of fighting inflammation by curcumin and boswellia are actually somewhat different. And what our hypothesis was what happens, because curcumin basically works by fighting inflammation through cyclooxygenase 2 or COX-2 pathway. On the other hand, boswellia uh, reduces inflammation or fights inflammation through a totally different mechanism called 5-lipooxygenase or 5 locks. So they both are inflammatory pathways, and our hypothesis was what happens if you take these two supplements together, maybe they will have much more effective uh, uh, anti-inflammatory activity, and that's exactly what we showed, that the combination of curcumin and boswellia works synergistically in colon cancer cells, and, and it allowed the colon cancer tumor growth to, to, to be uh, reduced 
even on the second or third day of the treatment. This is beautiful because uh, individually when you would give uh, these two treatments, it would take probably sometimes a week for, for uh, tumors to uh, reduce in size, but when we combine these two together, the, the efficacy was so strong that within second to third day of the treatment, you would see these colon cancers uh, shrinking in size. And here is a picture of this. If you look at the lowest morph panel, uh, this, which is the combination of curcumin and bacillia, you can see the size of these tumors is so much smaller compared to the controls, which are on the top, which are so much bigger. So this simply shows that using these multiple botanicals, the multiple functions uh, or different ways of fighting inflammation is a lot more effective uh, uh, in, in fighting these cancers. So moving on to the last part of the talk, uh, we have done recently quite a bit of work on uh, looking at uh, the grape seed extract, which is, an, again, again, a very wonderful uh, extract uh, uh, in terms of uh, cancer prevention or cancer finding properties. And here is uh, some other facts. So OPCs, so what are OPCs? OPCs are small-sized uh, oligomeric polyanthocyanidins which are very, very small molecules, small actives, which are present in grape seed extract. So if you take a grape seed extract, and most of the grape seed extract is actually composed of high molecular weight tannins. So if you take a grape seed extract, which is not enriched for OPCs, what you're doing is you're taking all of this group grape seed extract, but it is all high molecular weight tannins, which are not absorbed by our bodies. So you're basically flushing it down the system, but they don't give you much benefit. However, Small size OPCs, if you have a unique extract which has small, which is enriched for these OPCs, these are preferentially absorbed by our bodies, not like large tannins, uh, which are predominantly present in cheap uh, grape seed extracts. So you have to be careful that the extract you take is enriched for OPCs. So there is an extract uh, which we are doing the research on, which is called VX1, French grape seed extract. It is a unique grape seed extract because it does not contain any high molecular weight tannins, and it is highly enriched for small molecular weight OPCs. So this is wonderful because this is a unique grape seed extract because all it contains is these small OPCs. So when you take it, most of these OPCs are absorbed by our bodies, which in turn gives the therapeutic benefit you're looking at. And here is some of the data where we have shown, where we have compared head-to-head -head comparison of using this enriched VX1 OPC extract versus total grape seed extract. And as you can see, these are just a panel of different inflammation-causing genes that every time we treated the cells with either OPCs or GSCs, the efficacy of fighting inflammation or oxidative stress was a lot more effective by multiple fold in OPCs compared to total grape seed extract, which is nothing but essentially large molecular weight tannins, which do not have much or very, very limited benefit in cancer cells. And here's another way to look at this. This is an animal study, and where you can see that when you, the red line show using generic grape seed extract, actually the, the, the tumor growth is not very effectively reduced, but when, you, when we gave these animals this VX1 OPC extract, the tumor growth in these cancer cells is a lot smaller or, or the tumors did not grow as much compared to uh, the, using the genetic grape seed extract. And this is another way to look at it. If you look at this middle panel, you can see for yourself that within 10 to 14 days of using very small dose of OPCs, 100 milligram per kilogram, these tumors are so small in size compared to uh, using genetic grape seed extract. We have also done recently some studies in actual human subjects with colon cancers. And you can see here where we have patient number one and patient number two. So we have actual patients who have colon cancers. We took their colon cancers out, and we were able to grow them in petri dishes. And we were looking for how many cancer stem cells uh, this VX1 OPC extract can kill. And if you can look at all these, uh, the data shown in blue and uh, red bars, you can see that with the different doses of OPC extract, there was a reduction in cancer stem cells. So when you look at this word spheroid count, which is basically another way to say how many cancer stem cells are left behind, and you can see that within a matter of 72 to 96 hours, which is three to four days, these cancer stem cells are being killed very, very effectively by 
this unique OPC extract. So just to summarize my talk, uh, that using curcumin bosphilia OPCs, uh, we call them multi-targeted therapies because they don't have one target uh, in the cells, but they are multiple targets compared to the targeted drugs which, which we are using in the clinics, which only target one thing. Using these botanicals, actually you can target most of the inflammation-causing genes or inflammation-causing pathways is a much more effective and safer mechanism and a lot less expensive, too, compared to very expensive, highly toxic, and ineffective cancer treatments we are using in the clinic. So some of the take-home messages, which I've already covered, is that using these natural supplements, there's a lot of science behind. Please consider using these supplements uh, uh, when you're healthy. So, so like I said, yes, there's some evidence we can treat patients with uh, different diseases with these compounds, but in my mind, these compounds work the best in a preventative setting, so which means when we are totally healthy, we should start considering taking, using these as a part of our daily health. You know, just like we use multivitamins, we should start using some of these when we are totally healthy, so that we can delay or postpone or prevent disease. Curcumin is probably one of the most potent naturally occurring medicines. I told you a lot of evidence in cancer and many other studies. Uh, more than 12,000 studies published on health benefits of curcumin with about 4,500 studies on curcumin and cancer. Uh, turmeric is a wonderful spice. Uh, you can use it for cooking. Uh, it tastes good. Uh, but if you're looking for some sort of therapeutic benefit uh, or you're trying to prevent or treat something, then curcumin is the way to go because it is present in only very small quantities in, curcumin, uh, in turmeric. So using curcumin supplements is a lot more effective while you continue to eat food whenever possible yeah, with the spice turmeric. So what are the doses? There's no real uh, formula for this, but I can tell you that for treating cancer patients, uh, based on my own experience, some of the other clinical trials we are doing, a dose of anywhere between one to three gram uh, per day for curcumin is fairly decent dose for, for cancer patients. Uh, Bosley and Grace seeds are ex excellent companion products. Uh, they can be used on their own, or they can be combined together with curcumin. Uh, we've already covered that uh, one should be very, very careful. Not all curcumin, Bosley, or grape seed extracts are same. When you're taking curcumin, again, remember, you have to use a curcumin extract, which is highly absorbed, which is all natural, does not have any synthetic chemicals or, or, or toxic chemicals, and a lot of science. When we're using Bosphilia, we have to remember not to use compounds or not to use extracts which are highly enriched for beta bosphilic acids because uh, Bosphilia extracts with more beta bosphilic acid actually will trigger more inflammation. So when you're using grapeseed extract, please, uh, when you're using Bosphilia extract, please make sure to use a supplement which is highly enriched for aqua. Lastly, when you're using a grapeseed extract, most of the generic grape seed extracts, they contain high molecular weight tannins, which really don't help. So use the extract which has low molecular weight OPCs because those are the ones which are gonna give you some help, not the ones uh, which, which have mostly large molecular weight tannins. So I will leave you with this message um, um, that we do not know what the future of medicine is, where we're gonna go, but this was a, a thought from Thomas Edison a long time back that we have to worry about diets, disease prevention, rather than disease cause. And with this, I'll stop and I'll thank you so much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Goal. And we do have some questions already in the queue. Um, a lot of folks out there that are in our listening audience either are dealing with cancer themselves or they have a loved one who's dealing with it. Uh, we're ask, there's a lot of uh, asking for advice, but before we start answering the questions, I'd like to make sure that everybody understands that this is an educational presentation. Uh, we are not offering medical advice. We are not attempting to treat your cancer. We're giving you information for you to make your own decisions or to share with your doctor about potential natural interventions that might be very helpful. So I just want to get that cleared up since we have some pretty specific questions in the queue. So let's go with the first one. Uh, the first one is the, a person who's, who's excuse me, my, my, my uh, cursor's not working. Um, we have a person whose brother 
has been dealing with a, a cancer for a very long time. Um, and let's and let's sorry. Uh, as I said, my thing was frozen. Now I've got it unfrozen. He has four, stage four metastatic germ cell cancer. He was diagnosed for the first time in his 20s. He had chemo in his 20s. He was diagnosed again a couple of years ago. He underwent chemo again and a nine-hour surgery to remove a lot of the cancer. Uh, they followed it up with more chemo and radiation, which was devastating to him. She said that he almost died. And now he is not going to have any more of this type of treatment. So I believe the question is, is would these interventions be useful for him? Would you take all three of these products? Okay, so so uh, thank you so much for this question. Again, just like uh, Cheryl said in the beginning, um, uh, I'm a researcher. Uh, I'm not in a position to give any medical advice. And also, uh, maybe I should have said it before, anybody who is who would, even after listening to my talk or even other the thought of using these supplements, I would strongly encourage you to discuss uh, with the physician who is taking care of the patient first before you start any new intervention because I think as a patient you owe it, owe it to your physician and also just to make sure that try to bring them on the same page before you do any intervention. So having said that, now the question is, I'm sorry to hear that this uh, particular patient uh, has undergone so much of uh, pain and uh, and uh, suffering uh, from the treatments with chemotherapy and so forth. The question is, should this patient be taking one of these, all three of these? The, my, my short answer would be possibly all three. There's no reason not to be, because they all are very strong anti-inflammatories. They, they have long, uh, very strong antioxidant properties. And I've shown you examples. You know, as a scientist, we cannot do all the combinations, but I showed you at least a combination where we combined curcumin with boswellia, and we showed you that actually the combination was a lot more potent now. We have not done any studies yet where we have combined all three of these botanicals together, but knowing the data we have, knowing what we know about these compounds, uh, I would say that there's no concern about using all three together because they're very safe, they're quite inexpensive, and there's no reason to believe that they would collectively cause any harm. So I think that's the biggest thing. As a patient, one worries about would they cause me any harm, the likelihood of that happening almost zero. Would they give him, him or her some benefit? The answer is yes. Of course, every patient responds differently. Some people derive a lot more benefit than others, but there's no reason not to try it out all three together. Excellent. We have a lot of requests for copies of this presentation. Um, folks, if this will be uploaded to YouTube and also to the Terry Talks Nutrition website, so feel free, give us about 24 hours to get that done. So as soon as this is finished, uh, this is recorded and you can watch it again or refer your friends to it again if there's information that uh, you would like to have. Additionally, if you have specific questions or information from this presentation that you would like us to send to you, just contact us at terrytalksnutrition.com, info at terrytalksnutrition.com. Now here's another question that's not specifically on cancer, but you referred to different phases of clinical trials, and this person would like to know if you can explain the different phases of clinical trials. What do you mean when you say phase one or phase two? Yes, yeah, so so that's an important question again. Um, that's again not necessarily my area of expertise, but phase one trials are typically uh, safety trials, you know, because before we go to so phase ones are essentially. FDA wants to make sure that any time any compound is going, any drug, any compound is going to be tested, they have to undergo a phase one trial to make sure that these compounds are not going to cause any additional harm to 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 the individual who's going to take it. So so they're mostly safety trials. Uh, phase two are typically early stage efficacy trials to see uh, they're basically small pilot studies to see the efficacy of that compound. In, in multiple diseases most of the times. And in the phase three trial, it is typically a, a more focused, targeted, uh, with a very defined hypothesis, uh, with a very specific goal, a clinical endpoint typically, that the goal is we are going to give this intervention with the expectation that the patient would derive this level of benefit at this particular dose. So it's basically a progression. So phase one is pretty much safety trial to see there's no adverse effects or there are not enough adverse effects that this compound or drug should move to next level. Phase two is an early stage efficacy. Phase three is a more advanced uh, efficacy, targeted efficacy 
a typically randomized blinded trial. We have a lot of questions wondering, and, and so I'm combining folks, folks, forgive me, but in the interest of time, we have a lot of questions about dosages and proportions. Uh, is there a specific dosage for cancer that you would recommend of a curcumin with turmeric essential oil, for example, uh, a boswellia, standardized boswellia, and the low molecular weight, uh, the French grape seed extract? Yes, yeah, so, so this is a question I briefly touched upon it during my talk. Uh, there's no universal formula for these, uh, and I can only speak for uh, my own research and the clinical trials experience we have. Uh, so from the outset, like I said, we are doing uh, several clinical trials on cancer and a few other indications, and for the high absorption um, for the curcumin, we are using mostly BCM95 high absorption curcumin. So, so I would say a dose of about one to two grams spread over the day means two to three doses. So you want to make sure that you don't take all your curcumin in one dose because it's poorly absorbed, and you want to make sure that the, the, the dose there's always some sort of residual amount of curcumin in the body. So always try to split your curcumin doses. And so similarly for Bosphilia and grape seed too. So typically a range of one to two grams uh, BCM95 curcumin would be reasonable for to start with. Uh, for, for Bosphilia, Similar range, one gram, one and a half gram a day uh, of standardized uh, Bosphilia extract, which is standardized for uh, presence of uh, mostly aqua, not uh, beta bosphilic acids. And uh, and for grapeseed extract, we have not done any clinical trials, but but based on the data we have, I would say that a dose of again very similar, one to one and a half gram uh, over the day would be a good starting dose. So by that. So I'm giving you these individually because we do not have a real clinical trial where we have used a combination of all of these. But these doses are reasonably small, and and I think if you start with these doses, somewhere between one to two grams of each of these compounds over a day, and, and try it out for a few weeks, and that's what I tell most of the patients, and then go from there. If you see the benefit, and uh, you, can, you can increase the dose a little bit or reduce as needed. Excellent. We also have a lot of questions about individual chemotherapeutic agents, and I know we don't have uh, time to go through each and every one of them, but uh, is there, are you aware of any specific chemotherapies or radiation therapies for which you cannot use curcumin? That's one of the questions I've been asked is, um, while we may not have research on every single agent, there has been a lot of research in this area, hasn't there? Um, so that's, again, a very, very important question. So, so to the best of my knowledge, um, uh, really, for the most of the chemotherapies out there, uh, there should not be any concern. There, there are some drugs people have used for certain cancers, for breast cancers especially, uh, but those are a handful of studies where people have shown some concern. But I can tell you from my experience and what I've read, really there's no concern for most of the chemotherapies that I know because it also depends upon every patient. It depends upon the stage of the tumor. It depends upon the dose of uh, the chemotherapies and the dose of botanicals you're using. So I think if you're staying within these small doses of curcumin or, or boswellia or franken uh, for grapeseed extract, uh, really I do not see any concern that using these small doses of uh, these supplements would have any additional harm or concern uh, when you're taking such a notoriously toxic chemotherapy anyway. Excellent answer. Um, and let's see, there's a couple, there's, I'm just glancing through these, there's a couple of questions about recommendations for prevention. Would you recommend all three for prevention or just curcumin? And do you have, as is the dose for prevention lower? Yes, so that's a good question. So so I think if I have to honestly say, I think um, um, probably all three can be used for prevention, but probably the most, the largest body of data is for curcumin, that curcumin definitely does help because it is integral to certain parts of uh, food habits in some parts of the world, especially India and other parts of Southeast Asia where people use turmeric all day long and, and there's clear evidence that uh, people in those parts of the world, they don't get that many cancers. So I think if I have to pick only one, I would say curcumin definitely uh, can be used as a preventative, although there's no, I don't see a reason why not one would use Bosphilia or, or, or no, grape seed extract too. Yes, the dose force um, prevention would be different, uh, I would think, 
compared to compared to treatment for cancers. So in that case, I typically lean towards a lower dose, anywhere between 500 milligrams to 750 or even up to one gram a day, which means probably two pills of 350, 500 milligram uh, curcumin pills probably are a very, very safe and reasonably effective preventative dose for curcumin. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, in scrolling through this, I want to make sure that I got most everyone's questions. Um, here's a person who said, if it's an encouragement, my sister-in-law's mother had brain cancer. She combined three of the Boswellia 500 milligrams and nine of the BCM-985 curcumins you mentioned at 750 milligrams a day along with traditional treatments. She was given one to six months to live. That was over a year ago, and she is symptom-free. So she's doing extremely well on this regimen. So thank you to the, the kind lady. Uh, her first name is Connie, who shared that uh, bit of information with us. It is indeed very encouraging. Uh, we have time for one more question, and I think it's an excellent one. Uh, do you have to take black pepper for the absorption of curcumin? So, again, that's a very important question, too. So if the question is, do you have to take black pepper uh, for increasing curcumin uh, absorption? The answer is no. Uh, I know that people use it, and there's some extract where people have a combination of. Uh, uh, I think that the, the goal is to, to enhance curcumin's absorption, and, and I think there are some studies out there or some people believe that combination of black pepper with curcumin does enhance uh, uh, absorption of curcumin, which may be true. Uh, I'm not totally uh, sold on that idea. My other concern is uh, with using black pepper that compared to curcumin, which we have discussed uh, for the last hour, curcumin on its own is quite safe when you combine it with chemotherapies, other drugs, other prescription drugs, and so forth. So there's no, at least I'm not aware of most drugs uh, other than a very small group of drugs uh, which have blood thinners, such as warfarin. Um, in those cases, if people are taking warfarin, then they should be a little bit more careful considering taking curcumin. But other than that, curcumin is extremely safe uh, to take with virtually every prescription drug I know of. Uh, but when you're combining, if you, in order to enhance absorption of curcumin by combining it with black pepper, uh, then the game changes because there's quite a bit of evidence that black pepper actually could have negative interaction with a lot of prescription drugs. So I think, to, to me, that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a caution one must consider when, when they try to combine curcumin with black pepper to increase absorption. So, so, so the short answer is that is not the only way to increase absorption of curcumin. So that's why I focus my research on BCM95 curcumin because that, that's a highly absorbed, uh, high, uh, high absorption curcumin and, and the, the approach to increase absorption is by combining curcumin extract with essential oils, which are present in turmeric. So it works beautifully. So why would you consider using a, another uh, modality of combining with a black pepper? Because if you run the risk of uh, that compound having at least potential negative interactions if you're taking any other prescription medicines. So the short answer is that's not the only way to do it. Um, some people use it, uh, but I would be very, very careful uh, and cautious if you are consider using, going that mechanism if you're taking any other prescription medicines. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. And you have received so many kind words from participants who are saying what an incredibly uh, interesting presentation that this is. Here's another one that came through. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Another one that says, I'm going to go out and start on all three of these today. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Go, for taking time out of your busy day to share your research information with us about curcumin, boswellia, and grapeseed extract. And thank you for sticking around to answer the questions for us. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks again. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your busy day to learn more about natural medicine. Uh, if you would like to visit us at terrytalksnutrition.com, you can sign up for a free weekly newsletter uh, where you can learn more about natural health and also inspirational thoughts. You can listen to recordings of past seminars on this, on this website. There are articles, radio shows, and podcasts as well in our library. You can also find us on YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel, the Terry Talks Nutrition on YouTube channel. Uh, we also can, um, you can also find us on Facebook. 
for Terry Talks Nutrition, and we would be honored if you'd follow Terry on Twitter at twitter.com backslash Terry Limerand. Thank you, everybody, and we hope you'll join us again for another Terry Talks Nutrition educational webinar. Good health to you.